Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are all here. The jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds then immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Hello, it's lovely to be here today with you. Let me start with a bit of background. Paul is on his second missionary journey with Silas and Timothy. Occasionally the text speaks of we, which means that Luke was with them for at least part of the time. They've traveled through Phrygia and Galatia and been prevented by the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Jesus from speaking the word in Asia. Paul has had a vision from God of a Macedonian man begging him to come over to Macedonia and help us concluding that that was where God wanted them to preach the gospel, they went straight away. So from the start, we can see how Paul's ministry was directed by prayer. At each point, he and his companions asked God where they should go next. And Philippi was crucial. At that time, it was a Roman colony. It had been settled by Roman veterans. It used mainly Roman coins 
and its citizens were fiercely proud of their Roman status. It had close links with Rome itself along the Via Ignatia. It was so Roman, it was even known as Little Rome. Paul's aim was to spread the gospel and make new converts, but as was his custom, he sought out the Jewish believers in the city first, and he finds that there's no synagogue, only a small group of women meeting outside the city by the river where there was a place of prayer. Lydia is quickly convinced of the gospel and baptized along with her household, and she provides them with a place to stay. Now, on their visits to the place of prayer, they're followed by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. She shouted out on a daily basis, these men are slaves of the Most High God who announced to you a way of salvation. Phineas T. Barnum, the great circus man, is reputed to have said, there is no such thing as bad publicity. And Oscar Wilde wrote, there's only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. But in the same way that Jesus didn't like demons proclaiming who he was, Paul did not appreciate the source of the slave girl's recommendation. The original Greek describes the girl as having a spirit of a python. This was a snake associated with the god Apollo, and there was a shrine to Pythian Apollo not far from Philippi. In addition, the girl's message was ambivalent. She spoke of the Most High God. But to Paul's Gentile audience, that could have been one of several of the large collection of deities that they worshipped. Possibly Zeus, possibly Apollo. Also, she spoke of a way of salvation, not the way of salvation. To her Gentile hearers, this would have meant healing. Paul would have had to correct the misconceptions that her message created. Paul was troubled by the girl's words, possibly a mixture of anger with the evil spirit and compassion for the girl that was enslaved physically and spiritually and whose condition was being exploited financially by her owners. We're told that he simply said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And it did, immediately. Because his life was steeped in prayer, Paul was able to command the Spirit in Jesus' name. For us, that would be a powerful demonstration of the power of God to heal. But for the owners of the slave girl, it was the loss of their source of income. So they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. The accusation is firstly that they're Jews, and secondly, that they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Interestingly, it seems that the crowd didn't join in attacking Paul and Silas until after the slaves' owners had made their accusation. So throwing our city into an uproar was a bit of an exaggeration. Paul and Silas were stripped and beaten without trial and then flung into prison. The jailer was ordered to keep them safely, so he put them in the inner prison, probably a room with no windows, and he fastened their feet into the stocks. So a word about the punishment. The magistrates were accompanied by a bodyguard of men known as lictors, who carried a bundle of rods as a symbol of authority. The NIV tells us that Paul and Silas were stripped and severely flogged. The Greek New Testament talks of many stripes. The Jewish law in Deuteronomy chapter 25 restricted the number of lashes a person could receive to no more than 40, which sounds bad enough to us, but the Romans had no such limit. So Paul and Silas were in a bad way after the beating. Then in addition to being put in the inner part of the prison, they were fastened into stocks these usually had more than two holes and were sometimes used as instruments of torture, holding the prisoners' legs widely apart. We're not told that this happened to Paul and Silas, but we can be sure that it wasn't comfortable. And now we get to the amazing part of the story. It's midnight. Most people are asleep. Paul and Silas probably can't sleep. 
They're in pain. They're fastened into an uncomfortable position in the stocks. And so they pray. What sort of prayers would you pray in those circumstances? Please, God, ease my pain. Please, God, heal my wounds. Please, God, get me out of here. Those would be my thoughts. Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. They're praising God. How can they do that in such circumstances? These are men who have been guided by God in all their journeying and were called by God in a vision to go to Philippi. They know they are where God wants them to be. They've spent their time in Philippi preaching the gospel and have seen people like Lydia and her household come to know Jesus and be baptised. They might also have been aware that the other prisoners would be able to hear their singing. Luke reports that the other prisoners were listening to them. They were still witnessing, even in prison. They know they are doing God's work. They would have learned Jesus' commission from the apostles. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. They've been doing just that, and they know that Jesus is with them. So they praise God. They're demonstrating what Peter Maiden calls radical gratitude. They are acknowledging that whatever life throws at them, what God has given in Jesus outweighs everything. What God has given in Jesus, forgiveness, salvation, eternal life with God. Paul later wrote to the Philippian church, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And the Philippians knew it was true because several of them witnessed it firsthand. Psalm 100 tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise his name. And as Paul and Silas entered God's presence with praise, God invaded the prison with power. Apparently there were occasional earthquakes in Philippi. However, this one was just strong enough to shake the foundations of the building, open the doors, and loosen the chains of the prisoners. But not so strong that it brought the prison down on their heads. It also came at just the right time. Miraculous. It was not so good for the jailer, though. The earthquake woke him, and he thought the prisoners had escaped. If he'd allowed his prisoners to escape, he would have received the, the punishment intended for them. We don't know how many prisoners there were or what they were in prison for, but the outlook was not good. Paul and Silas do not seize the opportunity to, for escape offered to them. Paul's concern is for the life of the jailer. So he shouts out to him, don't harm yourself, we're all here. I'm not sure how popular he was with the other prisoners as a result. But the jailer brought Paul and Silas out of prison and fell on his knees before them. To him, an earthquake would have been a sign of the displeasure of the gods. He wants to know what he can do to be saved. Whether this is from the punishment the magistrates would give him if the prisoners escaped, or from further judgment from the gods, is not clear. But his question gave Paul and Silas the opening they wanted. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The jailer took them into his house and washed their wounds. He listened, he believed, and he was baptised. Even in prison, Paul and Silas were doing the work they had been called to do, telling the good news of salvation in Jesus. The next day, the magistrates ordered the release of Paul and Silas and commanded them to leave. Presumably, they felt they had made their point and Paul and Silas would be on their way, leaving Philippi in peace. 
However, it's at this point that Paul protests. He and Silas are Roman citizens. They have been publicly humiliated and beaten without trial. This is not acceptable treatment of Roman citizens. The magistrates had assumed that the two Jewish men brought before them the day before did not have citizenship and had acted accordingly. If Paul's complaint reached the ears of higher authorities, these magistrates could lose their position and possibly be disqualified from ever serving in government administration again. It's not clear why Paul and Silas didn't claim the privileges of citizenship as soon as they were arrested. Perhaps they did, and their pleas were drowned out by the shouting crowd and the violence and immediacy of the punishment. Perhaps the Holy Spirit told them not to reveal it straight away, because there was work to be done and people to be saved at the prison. Now the magistrates are on the back foot. Instead of ordering Paul and Silas to leave Philippi, they're trying to appease them apologizing and requesting them to leave the city. Roman citizenship bought Paul and Silas enough time to visit Lydia's house again, to meet and encourage the Philippian Christians before they finally left the city. So what can we learn from all this? Paul and Silas were men of prayer. It governed every aspect of their life, where they went, who they spoke to, how long they stayed anywhere. More specifically, they were men of praise. I don't believe they would have been able to sing praises to God in prison if it had not been their regular practice to praise at all times. I have to confess that I don't always find it easy to find words of praise. I have sympathy with Georgina Harkness who writes, not many persons can be expected to think up offhand words adequate to the greatness and glory of God. But in Isaiah 43, God speaks about my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And 1 Peter chapter 2 reaffirms this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is not a suggestion. We were made to praise God. So how do we do it? How do we praise God? There are many resources that we can use to help us. The Psalms are full of praise. Psalm 145 is one of my favourites. It begins, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. And it goes on to list some of God's attributes. Greatness, glorious splendor, majesty, power, abundant goodness, righteousness, and there's much more. We can also use the names of God as a starting point. The navigators have produced a resource called Praying the Names and Attributes of God. From El Shaddai, God Almighty, to Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, it reminds us of who God is. We can use songs and hymns of praise, just as Paul and Silas did in prison. The one that's been on my mind this week is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, Victorious, thy great name we praise. Another way into praise is to begin by thanking God for what he's done. From there, we can move into praising him for who he is. Ben Patterson writes, in thanksgiving, we list God's benefits. In praise, God is the benefit. We move from saying, what you have done is wonderful, to saying, you are wonderful. And prayer isn't just about what we say in our prayers. It, sorry, praise isn't just about what we say in our prayers. It also involves what we say to other people and what we do, how we live our lives. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 
Paul and Silas not only praised God in their praying and singing, they praised him in their witnessing, spending their lives traveling around, telling other people the good news of God. And they praised him in their actions, healing a demon-possessed slave girl, caring more about the safety of their jailer and about their own freedom. Not all of us are called to be evangelists, but we are all called to witness to the truth that we know. We're called to serve, to show the love of God to everyone we meet. We don't have to do this in our own strength. We probably wouldn't be able to sustain it for very long if we tried. We do it with the strength which God supplies. We're enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak the very words of God to people and to serve them, whatever their needs. Of course, we don't always feel like praise, but that's no excuse. Paul and Silas probably didn't feel much like praise in prison in Philippi. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. The use of the word sacrifice acknowledges that it is not always easy to offer praise, but we need to do it anyway. Many of the Psalms of Lament turn to praise at the end, and the writer of Psalm 42 commands himself to praise. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. There is power in praise. Praise lifts us above our current circumstances, however good or bad they might be. It's not a magic wand. It won't necessarily lift us out of our circumstances. But it reminds us who is in control. By praising God, naming his attributes, we remind ourselves of who God is and what he's like. Almighty, eternal, omnipresent, righteous, just, and also loving, forgiving, faithful, compassionate, and saving. And what does God want? Well, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. God wants us to love him. Pete Gregg in the prayer course tells the story of one of his sons climbing onto his lap and saying, I love you, Daddy. And that's what God wants. He wants us to look at him and say, Abba, Father, I love you. So let us pray. Abba, Father, we love you. Transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit and send us out into the world to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.